Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm happy that I've been invited by Eric. Uh, I'm happy that also Stan Nielsen is here today. Um, Stan Nielsen is my former boss in the forestry program at IASA, and also he has been the director of IASA. So I'm looking forward to intensive discussion. Yeah, well, um, um, a long list uh, about my work. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm happy that I've been invited by Eric. Uh, I'm happy that also Stan Nielsen is here today. Um, Stan Nielsen is my former boss in the forestry program at IASA, and also he has been the director of IASA. So I'm looking forward to intensive discussion. Yeah, well, um, um, a long list uh, about my working fields, actually. I don't know if you noticed, the only thing which was not mentioned was agriculture. Okay, um, this is now the challenge for today. But actually, in the field where we are working now, ecosystem services and management, um, it's all about agriculture, all about forestry, and all about land use. And, and this is more or less the topic, the broader topic, where I would like to guide you to a little bit. Um, Something about my institute, just uh, a little information for those who don't know it. International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, we say IASA, and our motto is Science for Global Insight. That means we really do uh, global research, um, not too much local, not too much regional, but it should be of local and regional interest and also the effects should be visible locally and regionally. Um, we are quite privileged. We are living in, in a castle from the former Habsburg people in the, in the south of, of Vienna. Not living, but almost all our life we spent there because we work very hard. And we have 18 national member organizations or member countries. Uh, among which the Nordics are very important, and I highlighted Sweden here. So you are also a member of IASA. You pay a membership fee, and all fees together make up 50% of our funding, and 50% we seek from elsewhere through external funded projects like um, EU projects, World Bank projects, etc. What do we do today? Science-based modeling and analysis. So the title already, IASA, uh, Applied Systems Analysis, sounds quite theoretically. Theoretical it is also. Um, we mainly uh, do mathematical modeling. We try to understand how systems work and we try to mimic then how they work through mathematical modeling. And I will get back to that a little bit later. Um, actually, we depend mostly on data. And this data we use then in our models and try to produce some relevant, some policy relevant outcomes. So we put focus on global problems, as I mentioned, in an integrated interdisciplinary and, uh, uh, way. We, are, we have the advantage uh, that we are non-governmental, so we are unbiased and independent in our research and we have huge networks and collaborations, not only in the member countries, but really globally. And these are the main topics where we are active in. We are active in energy, land use and forestry, population, evolution and ecology, atmospheric pollution and mitigation, and disaster and risk. And uh, since uh, about half a year, we are organized in such a way that we have three major research topics. This is food and water, 
energy and climate change, poverty and equity, and some cross-cutting fields around that. And of course, you see, they all overlap. So that means we have also, and we are aiming at, a lot of in-house collaboration, but of course, also a lot of um, collaboration with outside partners. The ecosystem services and management program is placed in the food and water area. And we are a very young program, actually, not only by the people who are working there, um, but we got only founded uh, in January this year. Um, the consequence of a merger between the forestry program, where Stan Nielsen was our leader, and the land use change program, they got together and are forming now the biggest program or biggest department at the institute. Okay, so far to a short introduction where I'm coming from. Uh, let's go into media res. Um, this is a very famous picture um, by a famous Swede called Rockström. Uh, he published it two years ago and it is about uh, boundary conditions and tipping points and where the, the global system already exceeded these boundaries. And we can see that the, sorry, the boundaries are this blue field and we have at least three areas. This is biodiversity, nitrogen cycle and climate change where we exceeded these boundaries. That means the tipping points where it will be very hard, if not impossible, to return in within the boundaries. So this is easy to say our field of interest where we should concentrate on, we try to solve or to contribute such uh, global problems. And uh, of course, there's a lot of adaptation necessary or adaptation research in the fields which already exceeded the boundaries and uh, mitigation necessary in the other fields, but also in these fields. And together with um, the nine societal benefit areas, these were defined by the group of Earth observation. Societal benefit areas are, for instance, agriculture, health, weather, climate, biodiversity. So these are defined areas uh, where any change can be for the good or bad of the society. So within this area we try to move. And as I mentioned before already, one of the most important thing is actually the land question. Um, there are some calculations made and they are quite easy that um, at the beginning of the last century, so about 100 years ago, um, every person on Earth uh, had about eight to nine hectares available, theoretically, of course, and now it's 1.4. And the problem is not only that the population is increasing, the problem is also that we all are used to eat much more than 100 years ago. So that means the calorie intake uh, um, is much higher and the more calories, the more space we need. The problem is we lost about five times the space we used to have and eat more. So there is a doubling of these problems which we should consider. In the end, this is a famous slide of Yasa. Also Stan has shown it already and made some calculations of that. If we try to find out how much land is now left over we can use in addition for our growth, for eating more, not necessarily us or me, but maybe some people in Africa need to, need, uh, need to eat more. So where can we produce it? And if we, for instance, say uh, we don't want to touch uh, pristine forest, we take it away. We don't uh, want to, um, or we cannot go into unproductive area. Uh, we cannot uh, grow food in deserts. We cannot grow food in high altitude or where there is too little precipitation. In a rough calculation, this is what is left over. Um, 719 million hectare. This is, sounds a lot. On the other hand, um, just to give you a feeling, 
about 10% of that area is burning every year here in Siberia, 10% in the forest. So it's not that much. And our biggest problem is we tried to construct here a geographically explicit map, but in reality we don't know where this area is. Is it really here in northern part of South America? Is it in Dublin <laughs> or in southern part of Sweden here? Um, this is highly uncertain and we don't know the quality of this leftover land and we don't know the owners and we don't know the use. Okay. Um, I have put up here a simple comparison of the problems we are fighting with. This is a, a global problem of researchers in this field and also especially a problem of institute like IASA where we need good data in order to feed our models because if we feed in bad data um, nobody will believe in our results. So the better the data, the better the outcome. Here, GLC 2000, this is uh, a very famous um, land cover product, so everybody who is working in that field might know it. It's a European product, it's produced at the Joint Research Center in Ispra. And um, I tried to make a comparison. Um, I tried to identify cultivated land in, in uh, South America and this is what comes out and now I compare that to another uh, very well-known gl uh, global um, land cover product which is MODIS and this is from the US so you see the result under the same request is quite different the difference is 50 percent the problem is nobody knows. We don't know how much forestry we have on Earth. This is a definition question, but also a very uh, delicate monitoring question. And also we don't know really exactly the land use. And resulting question is, okay, how much land do we have left over? What about this disagreement? How can we solve that? How can we talk with security? Are we in a bad situation or are we in a very bad situation? And this is a very expensive question, which is in between. Okay, so I'm coming from forestry. This is a tree, and on this tree in our program, we grow our models. And we have, for instance, a global agriculture model, which we use. It's EPIC, some of you might know it. It was uh, formed in, uh, built in the US under erosion. Uh, under the name of an erosion model, now it's an, a policy advice model. We have a global forest model, for instance, and we have in the center uh, where all this input should come together a global economic model called Globium. It's a biosphere optimization model. And all these models work in an integrated way and feed into this overall economic model which gives us a feeling of uh, feasibility of our suggestions, policy recommendations, etc. Um, we made a little exercise in order to find out uh, how much and how expensive this question of how much land do we have available or not um, is and in order to quantify it you know nowadays uh, qualitative information is nice but uh, you cannot convince anybody with that and we want to be policy relevant so we have to underlie everything with uh, with data with economic data with quantification so our our assumption was that we um, want sorry that we want to meet um, the estimated food and wood demand in 2030, but we make it a little bit more difficult, our scenario. We, and this is discussed a lot, we want by then to substitute 10% of all our fu um, fossil fuel, transport fuel, um, with uh, biofuel. This is the assumption, and we look into 11 world regions, and we have two variants. We have the assumption that we have additional land available or we have no land. So we look into the extremes 
and try to find out what's the price. Okay, so if we have no land available, of course we cannot use more land. But in order to meet our food and energy targets by 2030, um, if we have available land, we would use 30% more land in order to produce that theoretically. This is the baseline. If we now look at water, um, how many cubic kilometers of water would we use more by 2030? Um, if we have no available land, we would use more water. If we have available land, we would use less water. Um, it sounds a bit weird, but we will come back to that. It's all about intensification. If we have no land available, we have to intensify because we have to produce the same products at the existing land. And in order to intensify, we need about, what is it, about uh, 1,000 cubic kilometers more water than if we have land available because we don't have to intensify. This is an important point and we will get to that again. So what about greenhouse gases now? If we have no land available, we would have less greenhouse gas emissions than if we would have land available. Again, an intensification question. Intensification question, that's better. And what would happen to the prices? Um, no land available, okay, everybody understands that prices will go up, but quite skyrocketing. Uh, if land is available still, this 30% which we could use more, um, we have a very modest increase in the crop price index, for instance, which is, of course, then also a, a synonym for our food prices. So, the last slide is on the price for this biofuel. Uh, if no available land is there, the biofuel goes up like the food price because we produce it at the same place. So it's going to get expensive. And now the back of the envelope calculation is that this question here, this difference is 350 billion US dollar. So this is a simple costing thing. And in order to show how important it is to know about this uncertainty, do we have land available or not? It's a 300, roughly $350 billion question. That's an incredible amount. I cannot imagine how much that is. Okay, little exercise. The problem is, I mentioned before, the existing, the best land cover products do not tell us what is right and wrong. Is MODIS right, maybe, or is GLC, the European product, right? Um, and because we are so much dependent on this information, we had to help ourselves. We don't have so much money, even that Sweden is a member in our organization, that we could shoot up our satellite and make a better land cover uh, product. So we had the idea called geowiki.org and wiki, uh, everybody knows already what this means. Um, we had the idea to just involve everybody who is interested in that topic to contribute to validate existing land cover products. And for that we have a little web page with huge data background and um, everybody, you and me, everybody can go there without any problems to geowiki.org and help validate actual land cover products. In the background, a hybrid map, a hybrid map is constructed and with this better data we can, for instance, do smaller studies depending on the area or after quite some time when sufficient people participated, we can improve the whole global land cover product. 
every click which is done by an expert or non-expert will improve the situation of our information and uh, it is only a very minor cost compared to uh, satellite products. Uh, just a little bit how this works. We used Google Earth as a platform and um, if we go right into this field, for instance, for forest, we have invited uh, many um, renowned research institutes and universities to provide their information about forest biomass, for instance. So we have there um, of very different resolutions, global forest, European forest land cover, and so on. Uh, we have it for Africa, Europe, single countries, etc. Uh, we have the same in the making for agricultural data. And how it works is a little bit like that. This is all databases which are in the background. I have picked the example of Sri Lanka. And we are comparing the three most important uh, land cover products. As I mentioned, MODIS, GLC 2000 and Globe Cover. The issue is that all of the three are good products, but they are better in a certain area. Maybe uh, MODIS is better for Africa um, or better for agriculture than for forestry and another product is better in another area and in another field. So, um, the question is now we overlay them all together and where they have the worst um, results. This will be pointed out uh, in these red fields. And now the trick is that it is in Google Earth and you can zoom into that field and validate yourself this area. And if you imagine you have, for instance, uh, Sri Lanka or a part of Sri Lanka as your research area, you validate as many fields as possible and every click with this validation is MODIS good for that? Is Globe Cover good for that or GLC? Which one is the best? A very easy one helps to uh, produce this hybrid map in the background and to improve this data. So this is our approach in order to solve such kind of issues and this is very important also for agriculture. Then you have some of course features. This is how the product looks like if you just put it very simply on Google Earth then we made a, a little application that it becomes transparent and the more transparent the better you can look what is the real background. And this is a little thing, a little village in Sweden. You can see on the left hand side um, one product with a higher resolution, the squares are smaller. On the right hand side uh, another product with a worse resolution. And you see that this worse resolution of course is quite wrong because uh, it should say uh, about stem volume and you see that it indicates stem volume of forest in the middle of the village or of the town. So in this case you validate this product as the better one and we have already an improvement of the data set. Okay, back to our modeling tree. We were talking about uh, using an economic model. Now we look a little bit into what we can do with our agricultural modeling. And um, for instance, we can apply it to Europe. In this case, we wanted to find out uh, consequences, very geographically explicit consequences of management change. And uh, we decided to investigate a little bit from conventional tillage into minimum tillage. And we looked at soil organic carbon and the crop yield. So what we could find out, we, we go from conventional into minimal tillage and we see that we can increase the soil organic carbon so we can sequester carbon uh, by 0.2 tons per year and per hectare. Okay, fine, this is good. So let's all shift in agriculture to a more, let's say, organical way and we will increase the soil organic matter 
and we will sequester carbon and we will fight climate change with that. On the other hand, I remember or remind you that we are very scarce in terms of land. We find out that doing the same management shift from conventional to minimum tillage, we lose out in crop yield. So 0.3 tons per hectare or 8% of yield we, we lose by that. This is not intensification, this is the other way around. So this is also one of the very important things we have to have in mind. These are these trade-offs. If we decide to go for that, we should also know the consequences if we go the other way around. So we, let's say, mitigate climate change on the left-hand side and uh, we will become very slim soon on the right-hand side. Short clarification. Um, we looked at a whole array of crops, um, but in this case, of course, it should be relevant if there is tillage or not. But it was done for all EU um, countries uh, in a geo um, geographically explicit way on farm level, so very high resolution. But this is just an overall consequence I want to show, and in fact, the number is not important. What I want to point out is this trade-off which is the most important thing. If we find out great message here, you can, we can publish in Nature, but we should think about the trade-off. Okay, and now let's come to a very hot topic at the moment, and this is exactly this region here. This is the Horn of Africa, and um, in terms of food production, we, we cannot afford to not talking about that one. It's about combining satellite observations and crop model simulations uh, in terms of soil moisture. Um, this is a product um, which we did together with um, the Technical University in Vienna uh, and uh, shows soil moisture observations of this area. And uh, you see, of course, the, the more blue, the higher the soil moisture, and the more yellowish, brownish, the, the lower the soil moisture. Okay, where do I want to go? The interesting thing is to compare satellite data, which is something like measured real data, with our modeling data. And if we now look here into Ethiopia, um, we did um, three different plot comparisons, uh, what we get out of our EPIC model in terms of soil moisture um, prediction and compared to satellite data uh, in, in reality. And you see that we managed to get quite a good fit. So the gray, the gray is satellite data, as of here, like here, and the red one is modeled. Okay, where am I after? Um, this is if we put this correlation uh, back into a map. Um, we see that in some parts, more in the northern parts and central parts, we have quite good correlation. Um, here we have not so good correlation. Okay, but that's uh, a start, a beginning, and um, if we want to aim at predicting some droughts and, and famine in this area, we have to go that way because the satellite uh, cannot look into the future. But with EPIC, for instance, and uh, weather and climate generator, which is built into this uh, model, uh, we can try to at least uh, contribute to some kind of uh, alert system. Um, this is now uh, from a collaboration again with JRC, with the Joint Research Center, and this looks at the NDVA uh, data from satellite, and this shows you a little bit the very recent situation, just that you know what's going on. NDVI, the Normalized uh, Difference Vegetation Index. Um, this is the horn again, and uh, we see that in some areas where now the big problems are, this is probably the worst drought uh, over the last 60 years. 
There is a famous Austrian doing great work in Ethiopia. Um, he saved yeah, maybe millions of lives with his work, uh, but this is the biggest fraud since 60 years and he only started 30 years ago, so we have to take this uh, big dimension into account. I just remember the 80s and early 90s where Ethiopia was every day in the media. This is much worse this time probably. And if we now compare, um, this is the NDVI from uh, early June this year and we see that there is a very bad situation in southern Sudan and especially in Somalia and Kenya. Um, if we compare uh, the time series of uh, this NDVI starting in February uh, last year, um, we need to know that there are two rain periods, rainfall periods in this area. One is in summer and one is in winter and that means also that they usually can harvest two times a year. They have two harvesting seasons and already last year in February we saw that this NDVI where it is red uh, was really bad. That means that the, the crop growth was very far behind. If we then continue to December, the next rainfall period, um, there was already indications that this is going to be terrible because two periods after each other were without, basically without rainfall. And then in April 2011, same picture, and in June the NDVI was a little bit better because there were some very heavy rainfalls in between. The problem is that on this picture it looks better than it is, but uh, these rainfalls destroyed more than they made good. And this is the October to January um, picture of rainfall, which was not coming. The more red, the less rainfall. You see the color ramp here, 400 millimeters less in an area where you have, if everything goes well, 600 millimeter annual precipitation. And the same picture now in this other half year, February to July 2011. So this is something where we can really contribute with our modeling to better one time uh, ring the alert and okay, the model was a little bit wrong, but uh, most of this area we can more or less already help predicting, but the tools are not completely ready yet, but we are working on that. And this is the situation now, the IPC projections and this color for Somalia says catastrophic event and absolute disaster in terms of famine and, and drought. Okay, back from that to, to the tree and to our economic model, the global biosphere optimization model. Let me show you some of that. Um, it is a global model. We can at the moment look into 28 world regions. Um, in Europe, where most of our work takes place in terms of European projects, we have a higher resolution, so every country is a region. Um, other regions are um, put together, like former Soviet Union, uh, a huge part of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, or even South America. Once we have projects in there, we can increase our resolution of the model. In this case, for instance, sorry, um, we increased our resolution in, uh, in the Congo Basin, for instance, because we, we are doing some REDD, reduced emissions through deforestation and degradation modeling there. Um, this is a forest topic and I, I leave it out as far as I can, but one thing I have to show you and this is our latest product because this year is the United Nations Year of the Forest. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I'm a forester and we are working in the field, but actually uh, we cannot divide these two things, agriculture and forestry again. Why? I will show you in a second. Um, this was our voluntary contribution to this year of the forest. 
WWF every year is producing the Living Planet Report, where they tell their members in a quite thick report where the globe is heading to. In the most of the cases, it's getting worse, but he or they also uh, bring out some success stories. And in this case, they asked us to produce with them together the Living Forest Report because of this year. And uh, we were mainly using our global forest model and our global eco uh, economic model. And what we defined together, and this is quite important, is this goal for 2020, set zero net deforestation and forest degradation. Set NDD, a little bit complicated, doesn't sound so good. Uh, the important thing is this net here. Um, WWF came and said, um, okay, we want to stop deforestation by 2020. And we said, yeah, fine, uh, we can tell you what you have to do with it, but we should approach the whole thing from a little bit more realistic point of view. And we suggested to have a zero net deforestation. And this means in principle that if we cannot avoid to use some pristine forest and harvest it, we should uh, plant the same area uh, somewhere else um, in terms of having sustainably managed forest instead. But our basic aim is to avoid this deforestation. Okay, so what did we define? We defined uh, four different scenarios. The do-nothing scenario, the target scenario where we meet our set NDD target in 2020, uh, a target delayed scenario and half measure scenario. And uh, what can we do with that is to show, for instance, what is going to happen over the next 20, 50 years. And you see the loss of natural forest area globally. And we calculated that uh, if we reach the target set NDD by zero set NDD by 2020, we will lose still 55 million hectare of rainforest or pristine forest. Um, if we delay our target, this skyrockets to uh, three times more suddenly, 124, almost three times more. Or if we delay or if we have only half the measures we are aiming at, we will lose 139 million hectares. And if we don't do anything, we will lose 232. So I think this is quite a nice thing, a nice target. The problem is how do we reach that? And for that, we have also different variables defined. The variable diet shift, agriculture comes in the game. Bioenergy plus, also an agricultural question, pro-nature and pro-nature plus. These are the variables. By the way, everybody can access this report online uh, via WWF. And what are the results, for instance? Um, if we on the left-hand side don't do nothing with this diet shift variable, um, we will take in more and more calories. Just to have in mind that from 2000 to 2010, the calorie intake, the global calorie intake was plus 20%. So incredible amount. So if we follow that pathway, uh, we see where we end up. The entire world is going to need or to eat more which is for some regions very good, for us maybe not so good. I also try to reduce a little bit. Uh, and if we want to meet this set uh, zero net deforestation by 2020, uh, such a policy might help me to reduce because it still allows, for instance, poorer countries in Africa or South Asia to take more calories in and OECD countries have really to drop down. So this is how we can do it with the variable diet shift. And this is quite extreme. We will drop over the next 40, 50 years uh, from 1,000 uh, kilocalorie per capita per day down to uh, 
about half. Okay, these are now some feasibilities, uh, what can be reached by when, under which variable. I, I don't want to go into details here, but you can look it up. So we calculated it all and it is nicely prepared, not in a very scientific way, I agree. And we also have on other slides the uncertainties put up, but other slides I would need about one hour to explain. So um, it is easier to read that one. Uh, something very interesting is also um, what happens. Uh, strict conservation means high food prices unless consumption reduces. What uh, happens to uh, price in livestock and what happens to crop price, uh, depending which of the targets we want to meet. And of course, if we want to meet very high target, this means on the one hand side zero net deforestation plus we want this pro nature variable which means we conserve also all uh, biodiversity hotspots etc. Uh, this means similar to what I've shown before that the crop prices and of course also livestock prices will go up drastically. Um, Another point, and, and this is also interesting, where you might not think about at the first glance, is um, what happens if we need this intensification with our water consumption. Water consumption will go up. But if we intensify, this also means, means we do not have to put only water there. We don't have to irrigate only. We have also to put a lot more fertilizer there. Um, but what we see is that actually the nitrogen use and the phosphorus use goes down. And this is because of intensification, because we can make much better use of it. We produce more on smaller place. We can handle it better. And for that, we save fertilizer. What we cannot save is water. And this is the next big problem. But it is good that we can save fertilizer because I don't know if you heard about it but phosphorus is the next big problem we are facing because it's ending soon and there is no real substitution for that. Okay, some examples and this is something like um, okay, this is something like an overall um, conclusion what is going to happen with uh, the natural forest so if we don't do nothing, we learned before that um, anyway we will lose 230 million of natural forest and 242 million will go into converted, maybe sustainable forest management. If we meet our target, this word is 55 or 56 million before, we will have these losses of pristine forest and we will have converting 271 uh, into sustainable forest management or this is also replanted forest area. Um, then of course if we go for pro nature this is in addition to that we will lose even less but we still have to transform a lot of this forest area into managed forest. If not, we will not be able to come up with the resources need. And you see diet shift and bioenergy, this is so to say um, the, the directions we go and also some kind of trade-off. So what is a key conclusion from this study? With better governance, the world would have enough production forest and land available for agriculture to meet current demand for wood, wood products and bioenergy without further conversion of forests. Um, there is one slide I didn't show is that sad enough 80% um, of deforestation of these numbers is just for nothing. This is because of bad governance. Afterwards it's not used, it's cut down. Uh, some people take some quick money but this area is more or less lost and if we have bad luck this is in a mountainous area in addition where erosion comes in and we lose the soil and 
yeah, this area we can forget out of our 790 million. Um, do nothing delaying set NDD until 2030 will mean that it leads to huge and irreversible losses in biodiversity, uh, undermining the prospects of an early peak and decline in GHG emissions. The background for that I've shown you before. And um, as population and income grows, forestry and farming practices that produce more with less land and water uh, pollution will come in and new consumption patterns, the patterns that meet the needs of the poor while eliminating waste and overconsumption in our area, in the OECD countries, needs to take place. And, and a special recommendation for this area is reduce overconsumption and waste of food, okay? Reduce footprint of commodity supply chains, we have started something with EC legislation, these FLECT initiatives, certification of forest products, for instance, and a lot of other recommendations come in. The most important, if we talk about global uh, applicability of these policy issues, is that we strengthen the governance because we can come up with the best policy solution and we can model that it works perfectly if, for instance, a, a country in the Central Africa is so highly corrupt that nothing of our measures will be realized there. Okay, some general conclusions and I'm coming to an end with that. Um, land reserves are highly uncertain. Um, if we know how much it is, uh, how much, how high this uncertainty is, uh, this is a very valuable and a very costly information. Um, These food security issues, and I've shown the pictures uh, from the Horn of Africa, um, deforestation, biofuel trade-offs, and so on, they are really, they are real, they are existing, and um, it is also a question of technology, what you apply where and when and how. So this we can try to model and, and show out these consequences and show these trade-offs. Um, we should rather go towards optimizing systems instead of maximizing what which we mostly do because we just think into a very monetary way. But overall, we are much better off if we optimize. Um, and we have to come to that point that um, we have to look in a combined way, integrated way, into energy, environment, climate policies and so on. And this also means that, uh, like Eric did, inviting a forester to an agricultural seminar, for instance, is a good start for doing this integrated view. Um, what we need is spatial-temporal uh, analysis. If we don't have um, spatial information, as shown in one of the first pictures, we don't know where things are happening and we cannot optimize and we cannot tell anything about quantification and we cannot tell anything about optimization. Thinking cross-sectoral, seek for synergies. A good synergy if we apply these red policies is that uh, first of all, it's very cheap to use biosphere also to a little bit level of the problems in industry. It's, it's very cheap, but at the same time, we also can protect a huge part of these biodiversity hotspots if we try to avoid deforestation, for instance, in the tropics. Modeling efforts are complementary and better with socio and socio-economic methods. This is an example that if we, for instance, can uh, put into our considerations when we design a model or when we interpret the results of a model, these social factors like corruption, like problems with governance and so on, problems with realizing our suggestions, then we can get even more real results or close to reality. And finally, it's very important, again, where, what and how. And with that, I want to close now. <laughs>